Um, when I was invited to speak in this session, the, well, the topic was mentioned of uh, changing data sizes, and I also got a strong hint that um, th this, this was supposed to be a, a valedictory swan song or something, <laughs> or a, a per <laughs> personal history <laughs> of uh, uh, aspects of the topic that uh, I've had experience with. And uh, uh, thinking about this, uh, it turned, uh, I felt that discriminant analysis was probably a general uh, specific um, statistical area uh, which seemed to fit the bill so far as I'm concerned. So um, discriminant analysis through some decades, because I had to restrict it to my own uh, uh, experience. So the general objectives I'll uh, introduce to you in the hope that uh, some of you don't know it all. Um, the problem of discriminant analysis, um, I'll indicate uh, some new methodological developments as they occurred. Um, I'll certainly point out links with uh, the work that is done by uh, machine learning researchers, computer scientists. And uh, I'll kind of do this through uh, mentioning my own involvement with three data sets of inc in increasing complexity. So a bit of notation for the topic. Um, C uh, is going to represent the class indicator. Uh, we're going to have uh, observational units, which uh, will often be patients and they all belong to one or other of a number of classes. In the notation here, we've got capital C classes. So that's a response variable. Um, and then we have a, a P by one vector of predictors, uh, in principle measured on uh, each of the patients. Uh, we have available a set D uh, of individuals whose diagnoses are known. Um, here we've got N individuals, and they're called the training set. Um, there are little n of them, and uh, they are N1 from uh, class 1 up to Nc from class C. Um, and then there might well be a test set uh, of uh, little m u cases. Again, in th they are a test set. We in principle, we do know what their categorizations are. Um, and the, the general idea is that we build a, a, a discriminant rule, a rule based on the training set uh, for saying something about this categor categorical response on the basis of the predictors X. So that's really uh, what the main objective is. Um, then I've listed some alternative jargon for the same problem in different literatures. Well, classification. I think when I was a student, um, I remember some, someone saying, well, you should, you should call this activity discriminant analysis and classification you should actually um, keep that for cluster analysis, what is cluster analysis. But I, I think that's no longer the case. Anyway, classification, you're trying to classify these individuals in principle. Um, statistical pattern recognition from the engineering literature and uh, supervised learning. Supervised in the sense that, uh, well, learning, you're trying to find out about uh, the underlying structure uh, on the basis of the training data. And it's supervised in the sense that for those individuals, you, you definitely do know the classifications, you know, which um, individual comes from which disease category, let's say. So here's the first uh, of the three data sets. And th this is a, a data set on individuals suffering from Con syndrome, which is uh, uh, one of the many diseases associated with high blood pressure. And uh, within the data, there are two subclasses, so capital C equals two. 
Um, some of these patients um, have got the syndrome because there is uh, a benign tumour. Um, and the way to treat them is to uh, uh, extract the tumour by surgery. And then there, there's another subclass, uh, so-called hyperplasia, which is, a much diff which is really a blood disorder. And the way to treat those patients is through a drug therapy. So it's important to know um, for a new patient whether they are C equals 1 or C equals 2 because the treatment is totally different in the two cases. So what about uh, numbers? Uh, in the training set, there are 20 with benign tumour. There are 11 with um, hyperplasia. Um, there is a, a test set of 33 patients, and P is 8. So, uh, so that's the number of predictors. The predictors uh, age of the patient, the levels of systolic and diastolic blood pressure, and uh, the measurements of a, no a number of bio biochemicals, uh, one, or two, one or two enzymes, uh, one or two uh, hormones. So it's eight dimensional data. Um, so what are we going to do for uh, a new patient? So this is the, the lesson on discriminant analysis, I, I suppose. Uh, we set up a model and uh, the way it was done in the days when uh, I and others were encountering this data set. Uh, we take the joint uh, probability model for the disease class C and the predictors, which depends on some parameters, psi. And uh, we factorize it uh, as a marginal probability for the class and then a conditional uh, uh, density for the predictors given the class. And then uh, on that basis for, for this new patient, um, uh, we can construct by, uh, essentially by Bayes' theorem, uh, a ratio of uh, conditional probabilities of the, the class given X um, according to this uh, right-hand side here. So we've got here the ratios of the two marginal probabilities for the class and then the ratio of these two uh, class conditional densities. And uh, a, a basic Bayes rule would be to say if, if that ratio is bigger than one, then you would assign the new patient to C equals two, otherwise to C equals one. And if the class conditional uh, densities of the predictors are normal distributions, then out of this you get the linear and quadratic discriminant rules depending on whether or not the, uh, the two normal uh, covariance matrices are equal. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, well, there's that formula again. Uh, we've got to, to actually construct a database rule. We have to, um, to estimate all those various quantities. And um, in, in Say in the days when uh, I was interested in this, uh, th there was special interest in the second <coughs> factor, estimating the ratio of the class conditional densities. Um, and John Aitchison, Dick Haberman, and Jim Kay uh, compared two approaches to this. They've obviously got to do something about the unknown parameters. And there was a, what they call the estimated method to plug in, simply, estimates for the uh, relevant parameters uh, here and uh, construct the ratio on the basis of those plug-in values. Uh, the alternative is obviously average out the unknown uh, psi 2 here and that uh, created what they call the predictive approach. I think in, the, in, in those days um, the estimated rule, well the estimated rule gives the kind of best data-based uh, linear and quadratic discriminant functions. Um, and the point that they made was that if you, uh, if you take the predictive approach, in which case you end up with uh, T distributions rather than uh, Gaussian distributions, um, the odds that you got out of it were much more, uh, much more reasonable. 
the estimated method produced extremely extravagant odds for of one disease rather than the other. Um, and then John Aitchison, in a short paper, indicated uh, in a kind of uh, uh, nice theoretical way why the predictive approach was, if you like, the optimal thing to do uh, based on the cobalt libeler uh, discriminant function and the cobalt li libeler divergence between distributions. Um, well, the aspect of this that, that I got involved with at this time was actually uh, how do you handle the case of uh, extra data, extra training data, uh, where you, uh, you know the predictors, but you haven't yet got around to actually formulating a diagnosis. So these are unconfirmed cases. So the training set may can may include additional unconfirmed cases. Um, so you don't know what they, even, <laughs> even for them, you don't know what they, uh, what disease they have. And effectively, you have da data from a mixture distribution. Um, and the, the, the trouble with that is that uh, if, you, if you have a training set uh, of that type, then um, you can't, incorporate these uh, exactly into the inference system. There's no kind of explicit uh, solution for uh, constructing the discriminant rule. So uh, this uh, paper in applied statistics mentioned there, I uh, said, well, okay, I'll incorporate the confirmed cases into the, <coughs> into the inference mechanism, and then I'll, I'll take the unconfirmed cases one at a time and sort of put them in uh, uh, recursively um, using a method which I think was called fractional updating at the time. You, you say, well, this uh, unconfirmed case ha is, you put a proportion of it into the class one and a proportion of it into the class two update estimates of, uh, condition of class conditional means and variances uh, on an probably intuitively sensible way of doing it, and uh, get an approximate approach for um, building in these cases. Uh, now, it's very ad hoc, and I think I did some numerical experiments and, and said, there you have it. Uh, next paper, please. Um, but um, it's a sort of, it, it was a, a kind of recursive, EM-like procedure, uh, as it turned out for the case of class conditional normal distributions. And uh, there were quite a few uh, uh, pieces of work subsequent to that um, uh, on recursive EM-type procedures. Uh, in particular, the most recent one that I know of is by Cathy and Moulin in the GRSSB this year, and they have a, a much more respectably um, rigorous uh, approach to this sort of algorithm. Um, it's also quite similar to uh, a method from the engineering literature, I think this is, called assumed density filter and has uh, links with um, a method, uh, an approach called uh, expectation propagation by Tom Minka from the computer science literature. Um, I was going to tell you about that, but I'm obviously not going to have enough time to. Anyway, when you have some data from uh, who, whose uh, true categories you know, and uh, some which are unconfirmed, um, the, that particular scenario is called semi-supervised learning. Some of the, it's partially supervised learning, where you know everything, and partially unsupervised learning, where you only know the predictors, you don't actually know the true classes. So I'll have to skip over this, I think. Um, so the, the expectation propagation algorithm is, is a very intriguing idea, it's, and it's certainly something that uh, I, I'm trying hard to get to the bottom of, understand properly. Uh, second data set that I was going to talk about is 
data set on uh, people with severe head injury um, gathered by the Southern General Hospital in Glasgow. And this resulted in uh, a multi-author paper, a multi-multi-author paper in statistical terms, uh, which was a discussion paper in 1981. Here, um, just see how the numbers are going. Here we had uh, 500 in each of the training set and the test set. Um, P was still quite small, uh, 12 predictors, age, uh, scores of various responses, the stimulus is to the patients in terms of uh, uh, the physical and ocular responses and so on. There's some missing data. Um, and it wasn't really a diagnosis problem, it was a prognosis problem. Uh, you wanted to know after 20, uh, 24 hours after the patient came in, what, we, what were they going to be like in six months' time? And uh, in the training set, uh, it turned out that over half of them uh, died or were essentially vegetated after the six months. But 190 showed a good to moderate recovery. And a fairly small number, 52, um, would suffer severe disability after six months. And uh, in a way, they're the most important ones because they're the ones that are going to really need and justify having uh, a lot of care devoted to them. So uh, we had this uh, large exercise we carried out. Um, it was really just, a, it was, you know, there's no theory in the paper, it's just a, a very large um, comparative study of a whole lot of methods. Uh, for um, establishing discriminant rules. Um, for instance, the, the standard uh, uh, linear discriminant analysis, uh, other parametric models for the class conditional distributions, uh, kernel density estimates for the class conditional distributions, uh, logistic regression. And uh, we looked at various variable subset and we evaluated the methods by different criteria. Error rate, misclassification rate is one obvious one, but there are others, uh, uh, perhaps measuring uh, the um, effectiveness of the calibration of the rules. And if the rule says that um, this, this, pa this patient has an 80% chance, chance of being in this category rather than another category, how did that pan out in practice? Were 80% of those patients categorized in that way? Um, lots of conclusions of which I've just pointed out one or two. Um, the first two indicate, roughly speaking, that um, simple methods did pretty well, really, compared with more sophisticated ones. Um, and it's also highlighted the difficulty of identifying the, the so-called severely disabled people, partly because there weren't so many of them, and partly because they're inevitably somewhere between the, 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 the ones with a poor prognosis and the ones with a good prognosis. And it was very, very hard convincingly to, to identify those. Um, as I say, we had a whole lot of methods uh, based on estimating class conditional distributions. The other approach to this whole area is exemplified by logistic regression. Um, it started off by indicating that the, uh, the modeling started with the joint probability function for the class variable and the <coughs> predictors. And there are two ways of factorizing a joint distribution. Uh, one based on oh, there it is, uh, the class conditional distribution and the other based on the direct conditional distribution of the class variable given the predictors. Um, and Phil David uh, in 1976 uh, identifies these, ident identified these factorizations and referred to them as the sampling and diagnostic paradigms. And logistic regression is the canonical uh, version of the uh, diagnostic paradigm. And the next 
uh, page starts off in the following way, and I'll see what it is now because it's easy to refer back to this. If you're happy with this model and your aim is the distribution of C given X, then um, unconfirmed cases will add information. Unconfirmed cases follow, therefore, a mixture distribution and will add some power to your um, discriminant function based on the distribution of C given X. However, if you um, are going to adopt this sort of uh, uh, factorization where phi 1 and phi 2 are distinct, then uh, data on the predictors alone doesn't do anything for you in estimating uh, P of C given X. Um, this is a bit of a puzzle, really. So that's what it says there under the sampling paradigm. Undiagnosed cases contribute to estimation of the discriminant rule, and the diagnostic paradigm they don't. On the other hand, uh, it, it does mean that if you're happy with the diagnostic paradigm, the logistic regression, you don't need to bother about estimating uh, the marginal, marginal probability function for x. It could be anything. Um, anyway, uh, another reason for mentioning this uh, particular topic is that uh, uh, there's, there's been a resurgence of consideration of, of these two paradigms in the machine learning literature. Um, sampling paradigm is, called, is effectively the so-called ge the generative approach and the diagnostic paradigm, the discriminative approach. So there's been a lot of valuable recent work in investigating these and kind of hybrids mixing the two approaches together in all sorts of different ways. Um, massive literature. So um, data set three is uh, an oft analyzed data set by many people um, where we have uh, a training, training set with uh, N1 people suffering from acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia and N2 suffering from acute myeloid leukemia. Sample sizes in the training set 27 and 11. Um, the test set has 34 uh, split 2014 and P it's not 8 or 12 anymore, it's 3,934 uh, after pre-processing. So th this is gene expression data from microarray analysis. So we got all these, uh, all these predictors. And, well, lots of people, as I say, have analyzed th th this, this approach with different particular angles. And the one that I was involved with, with uh, uh, Peter Hall and Zhang Hui Xu, uh, we applied a, what's called the tilting variation of a simple uh, centroid approach. The centroid approach says simply, um, look at your new set of predictors and compare it with the averages of all the predictors from the two groups. If you're closer, basically if you're closer to the to the, the group one rather than group two, then you'll put them with group one, otherwise you know, uh, with group two. Uh, so it's an extremely simple algorithm. And as I think, uh, I'll say that uh, one thing that's happening with, with these cases of very large numbers of predictors is that people are tending only to use very simple rules at the basis of it. So there's nothing particularly sophisticated. So our variation, went as follows, um, it effectively am, uh, uh, amounts to um, assigning weights to the individual predictors, modifying the centroid formula, uh, the, the, the distance to the centroid by putting weights on uh, the different predictors, and uh, trying to find the optimal values of these Qs. Uh, uh, QK equals 1 over P for all K would amount to the, the raw centroid method. So I, I, I'm not going to go into the, the details, but it, it turned out that we developed a, a 
a method which involved um, obtaining kind of optimal cues by quadratic programming. And uh, that had w one effect that that had was that uh, um, some of the QKs turn out to be positive and some of the, the rest of them turn out to be zero, which, of course, effectively does a variable selection for you. Um, well, according to our uh, an empirical analysis of that data set, um, out of the 3,934 variables, we ended up with a scenario with uh, 16. Uh, and applying them to the uh, test set, uh, we got them all correct about uh, bar, bar 2. Um, I'm not saying it was any... Uh, there are other methods that have also uh, been equally successful. Uh, I get the impression <coughs> that there is, there is one of the data set which there's no way that anyone uh, with a sensible rule will, will get correct. But, uh, so we weren't quite down to one, but we were down to two. So the data set has increased in the sense of the number of uh, predictors. So in conclusion... Uh, well, I tried to emphasize uh, the nice things that are going on um, outside the mainstream statistical journals, although there's definitely uh, infiltration in both directions, if you like. Uh, there are lots of other modern approaches to discriminant analysis that I haven't uh, mentioned in detail uh, or at all so-called support vector machines, um, which are ways of, well, the simplest version of a support vector machine is another way of creating a li dis linear discriminant rule uh, that's different from Fisher's rule. Um, if, if, if the statisticians had invented this, it would be called a support vector algorithm. But... Uh, it was invented from the computer science side, so it's called a machine. Um, just like the EM machine would have been in other circumstances. Um, I've not described any really large-scale data, data sets, data problems, of which these are uh, a few. And uh, I've given a hint of the importance of sparsity during the discussion of the third example. Uh, nothing about the relevant theory. Uh, and it's over to Jared to uh, perhaps help us along with that a little bit. Thank you. So uh, the title here is not actually what's in the, uh, the, the uh, program. This is going to be a talk about compressed sensing, but I thought I would uh, start by not going directly into compressed sensing, but sort of introduce it in a language which may be a little bit more familiar with uh, to, the, to the audience of statisticians. And the first... Uh, example I'm going to give is actually not an example I did, but this is an example by a student of, uh, a former student of uh, Professor Donahoe, uh, Vicki Stodden. So here's the, uh, the question she looked at. She said, let's take a, a standard linear model, okay? Uh, let's be in this setting that uh, Mike was talking about at the end of uh, P being larger than N. In fact, in this case, it could be much, much larger than N. We could be talking about very large problem sizes. And, uh, having x be Gaussian. Now, we're going to uh, impose on the problem that there's some kind of simplicity built into it. So we're hoping that there are k predictors that we're looking for in this model. And uh, we're going to scale the problem in this particular funny way. Uh, one is this parameter delta, which is a measure of the uh, of little n uh, compared to, which is our, our number of, uh, of observations, compared to p, our number of predictors. And also, and that's going to be this, uh, this axis. We also have this other scaling, which is k, a measure of, our, of the complexity of the signal, as compared to the uh, number of measurements. Now, this corner up here corresponds to the case where the signal is relatively complex. So k is relatively large compared to little n, and uh, the number of predictors is very, very large compared to the signal length. And we should imagine that in that sort of a domain, we're going to have real difficulty. But in this other domain, we should sort of expect that maybe things will work. So here, we have almost as many measurements as predictors. 
And the also we have that the uh, the simplicity, the richness of the uh, of the uh, the solution we're looking for is really very simple. And she ran an algorithm, just standard forward step rise regression using a false discovery rate for termination, and she observed an interesting phenomenon. And that was that in this region where you would sort of suspect things would work well, she found that things did in fact work well. And in this region, she found that things in fact did not. So here we were able to get, uh, she was able to accurately reconstruct these uh, K coefficients that we were interested in. And in this region, she was not. And you see a, a transition, this is this phase transition phenomena in the title, where it goes from being successful to not being successful. This is purely empirical. We don't really have a, a good understanding as to why this is going on, but we'll get to some things where we do have some understanding. And notice overlaying this is this uh, sort of mysterious black curve, which doesn't look exactly like it's fitting this. You know, it's a little too high here, a little too low here, but it looks sort of suspiciously close. Okay? You might suspect that there's something going on there. So this, uh, this transition is what we're, we're curious about. Let's, uh, let's take a look at another example. Uh, so here we're going to be looking at outlier detection, but we're going to be back in the classical setting of P less than N. So we, again, we have a, a linear model, but now what we're going to do is we have some, uh, some wild outliers in this variable W. We have K entries which are just completely inappropriate. They're just much, much too large, uh, and we want to try to find these to remove them from our data set. So, okay, well, we're going to do the same game as before. We're going to use uh, an L1 uh, regularizer, <laughs> And we're going to scale things uh, as p over n and k over n, uh, similar as before. And we see the same kind of phenomena going in, uh, where here we're able to successfully find the outliers, and here we're not. And we see a very abrupt transition between those two cases. So it really seems like there's a case where it's going to work very well, and there's a case where it just isn't going to have any success at all, and we're going to be very far from the answer we're looking for. Now, uh, this curve looks very different from what we had on the previous slide. Okay, so here we are. Let me go back. But this looks sort of like it's the exact same slide as a, a figure as I showed on the previous slide, but it's not. It's this curve, but with a rescaling. So we rescale uh, just this axis to be delta over n, uh, delta, uh, sorry, n minus p over uh, n, and we see a similar kind of phenomena. And now we'd overlay again this black curve, which here is the same, but in this different scaling. Uh, and we see, again, a pretty good agreement. Here it looks really quite good. Have you taken this data in that scale? No, the P is also... No, so, so this is um, saying, yes, we've, we've scaled the K over P as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so again, we see this abrupt transition from success to failure. All right, now in this case, we actually do know what's going on, and we'll go into uh, why this is happening. Okay, now the title of the talk that was actually in the brochure said that I was going to be talking about compressed sensing, so let's look at a same kind of example in compressed sensing. So here I'm going to switch notation first of all, and I'm not going to be using the n and p, I'm going to use little n, the same as before, and instead of using p for the predictors, I'm going to use capital N, I'm going to be switching to sort of the, the compressed sensing notation. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure some signal x that we're interested in by applying uh, inner products with Fourier. So we're going to measure Fourier, uh, Fourier coefficients of the signal, random Fourier coefficients. Uh, again, we're going to have this simplicity constraint that the vector x that we're interested in only has k non-zero, so it's a simple vector we're looking for. And we're going to scale everything in terms of this, uh, this delta. Now instead of being n over p, it's n over n, but these are the same variables, and k over n. And we see that in this region, if we do L1 regularization, okay, we're able to exactly recover those k non-zero coefficients. Not approximately, but here exactly. And in this region, we get an answer which is quite dramatically different. So we're not able to recover those. And again, we see the same curve, and everything seems to be just like before. Okay, so this is what's going on in compressed sensing. This is sort of why people are curious. But you can see the same thing happening over again in sort of lasso, uh, a robust optimization, various other questions like that. So uh, compressed sensing, what is compressed sensing? Well, you sort of saw a sketch of it on the prior slide. The idea in compressed sensing is imagine that it's for some reason expensive to measure your vector that you're interested in, some signal. So for instance, it could be, uh, well, there, there could be many reasons why it could be costly. Uh, there are defense reasons, there could be uh, patient healthcare scanning time reasons for medical imaging, 
various kinds of reasons. So I have this costly there because I, I'm intending to be quite vague. Now, uh, this technique has been, uh, so in compression testing, when it's costly to do this measurement, we're going to build in some simplicity assumption. We're going to use some nonlinear reconstruction algorithm, and this is going to allow us to, to get around sort of what people in signal processing have usually thought was the rule, which was if you have a signal of length capital N, you must make capital N measurements in order to find out what that is. And then you would do uh, just a regular inverse, and you would find the solution. OK, so let me show you uh, a few applications uh, where this has been done. This is a, a very uh, quick sketch of how this works. So you have a bat signal that you're interested in. Okay, It doesn't look simple at all. Okay. It has all kinds of, of information going on. But if you take its Fourier transform, what you see is it has a few large coefficients in some domain there and there. And the rest of the domain, it's very, very small. So although it doesn't look obviously to be simple, in the proper representation, it in fact is. So what we do is we measure this signal by taking inner product of, of this, this sparse simple representation with noise. And this is our way of, of acquiring information with every measurement about this, this content here without actually knowing where it is. Right? If we knew where this information was, we would just go and measure this directly. But if we don't, then we're going to measure some inner product with noise, and that's going to, in some sense, uh, feel this effect going on, and from that we hope to be able to recover where this is large, and hence from that be able to recover this uh, signal of interest. So that's how we measure things, it's just linear measuring for the matrix A. Uh, now we need to do the reconstruction. The reconstruction is where things start getting sort of more familiar to you, but maybe a little less familiar to the people uh, in signal processing. We're going to be using uh, essentially uh, classical kind of uh, regression techniques such as thresholding, apply the transform of the matrix A to the vector, and then just threshold, keep the large coefficients. Or you could do something more sophisticated like Fourier stepwise regression. We saw that in the first uh, slide. Or you could use some more sophisticated variants of that. Or you could use some kind of regularizing technique such as LASSO or the Danzig selector, some kind of technique on that becoming a little more sophisticated. And what we need in order for this idea to work well is we need that we have a good encoder-decoder pair. So we have some way of measuring these vectors, which is efficient, such as a random matrix. That works well, it turns out. And we need a decoder that works well, such as one of these. And it needs to be computationally efficient, so we need to be able to run this algorithm quickly. And we need a large region where we can guarantee that if the vector were simple, we're actually going to recover back that exact vector. So we need a strong theoretical backing. Uh, and ideally, what we want is the number of measurements we're going to be making isn't going to be k, right? That's too much to hope for, but proportional to k. So hopefully with a small constant. Say, we'll measure not the optimal of the ortho rate of k, but say 2k, 3k, 4k. Maybe there's a logarithmic factor, but some small multiple of k. Okay, so here's an example where they did this kind of thing. It might seem sort of weird that we're doing these inner products with random noise. Well, here's how one can make a device that does that kind of thing. You have a, a scene which you want to image. You have it come in with the lens, and you have the light get focused on a uh, digital uh, uh, micro mirror device where it reflects some of the light up and some of the light off to the side. The light that goes up, we put it into a lens, we focus it on a photodiode, and we record the light. And what we've effectively done is we've taken an inner product between the scene we're interested in and some random one zero pattern. And we flicker this pattern, and this is how we are going to make these uh, sort of unusual compressed sensing kind of measurements. We record those, but we don't make as many measurements as if we did the sort of standard technique, which would be have one of these focusing light up and all of the rest turned off. And then switch to a different one being on and all the rest turned off. That would be sort of typical kind of way you would measure. We're going to do them in groups. We do this, we make 2% as many measurements as, uh, as the full set. And we do a reconstruction, and here's a, an example. We had a, just a black background with a white R. This was done by uh, Baranuk and Kelly at Wright. And we do the reconstruction, and yes, in fact, it does look like an R. So you can see that this kind of thing can be done in practice, and it, it sort of looks the way you would like. And there are many, many other applications. I can't go through them all. Uh, it's actually recently this technique is being uh, proposed and was put into the hardware for a satellite that was launched recently. Uh, here's an example for uh, medical imaging. So you do MRI. Here's if you do uh, under severe undersampling and traditional reconstruction. Here's what happens if you do compressed sensing, i.e. using something like lasso. So we do much, much better. We're able to uh, get a much better 
visualization of the heart. Here you can actually see uh, the interesting anatomical features, whereas here it's sort of just noise, effectively, because of the severe undersampling. Okay. So uh, in this phase transition phenomena, we had our three interesting variables, k, little n, and big N. Think of this as p if you would like. And we want to have the number of measurements not be k, but proportional to k. As a side note, it turns out that it's actually very easy to prove that almost anything will work well if your number of measurements is proportional to k squared. It turns out this can be very simple Gershwin disk theorem, basically near algebra. But if you want to push from uh, k squared to k, then it gets much, much more complicated. That's going to be sort of the subject of, of what we've been looking at. And that's why we had the scaling uh, of uh, n compared to k, not n compared to k squared, so that we see this near optimal scaling. OK, so let's take a look back at this L1 regularization, i.e., thinking of lasso. This is a, a simplified version of lasso. We don't have noise, but uh, we'll get the, the full noisy variant as well. So what's driving the success or failure of lasso? Well, we have this min L1, right? We want to minimize the L1 norm of something. And what we're hoping is that we had this sparse vector that we measured, and we're hoping that's the one that has the min L1 norm. And then that would mean that the argmin that we would get back would be the vector we had measured, the signal of interest, and voila, everything works well, we get the signal back. Well, how are we going to know whether that's the case or not? Well, look at the L1 ball. Imagine a vector that you're interested in, say here. It's a vector that lives on a low dimensional face of the L1 ball, so it's case simple. Right? That's the constraint that we've built in. That's the only reason why this is working at all. K non zeros lives on a K minus one dimensional face of this L1 ball. Now, we can add anything in the kernel of A, and that's not going to change our measurement. So that's really the problematic issue. We're wondering what happens with the kernel of A, here represented by this red line. If the kernel of A goes interior to this L1 ball, then what's going to happen is we could, get, we could add something that wouldn't change our measurements, but would give a smaller L1 norm. And when we solve this min L1, we'll get some other solution rather than the one we wanted. So what we're hoping for is that if you have this uh, null space vector, that in, when you intersect it with the, uh, the L1 ball, where you start it at the point of interest, that you in fact get only the vector you're interested in, and then you're going to do the successful recovery. But if it goes interior, then actually you should expect that it's not going to give you the vector back that you wanted. So it's quite clear this is actually uh, telling us, you know, this is the model for when our algorithm is successful or not. And if you add noise, then you get this relatively simple change that essentially the null space, you, you allow things to be slightly different as well. So you put a tube around the null space, and then you wonder, well, this is going to go interior, but how far interior does it go? Well, if the null space went interior here, then it's going to be very far away. But if the null space didn't, then because of the, uh, the sharp angles here, hopefully it's not going to be too far away. And now you have to start wondering about questions about not just whether it goes interior, but the angle it makes with the faces. Okay. Now, if you also don't know which uh, uh, k non-zeros you're interested in, you want to make a statement that says something like, well, I'm going to look at the majority of the signals that are k sparse, and I want to make sure that my algorithm is going to be successful. Then what you have to do is you have to imagine putting this null space at all of the different k faces, and then checking whether it goes interior or not. And you need this sort of for the predominant number of, of k faces, it does not go interior. Now, if you wanted to be even more strict, maybe you had a particular application where you sort of expected that there was going to be some malicious uh, force trying to corrupt your, your technique and make it work very badly, then what you would want to do is make sure that actually this null space doesn't go interior anywhere. Okay? Now, this is a way of viewing things in R capital N, which is hopefully pretty clear. Uh, but there's a different way of looking at the uh, things, not looking at it, the problem in the signal space of R capital N, the, no, the predictor space, but in the measurement space. So in the measurement space, what happens? Well, we are essentially applying the matrix A, which is how we're measuring things, to all of the vectors that we might be interested in, i.e. all of the things on the L1 ball. Okay? So what happens when you do that? Well, you end up with some new geometric object. So this is in our little n. What you end up with is the convex hull of plus or minus the columns of A. And the phenomena that we saw before repeats itself, but it, uh, it appears slightly differently. You had a k face you're interested in. That k face either remains a k face of this new object, or it becomes a k face which goes interior. If it goes interior, then that corresponds to the case where this null space goes interior. Right? These are exactly equivalent. 
It's about the cone of, uh, of inward pointing direction. And if it stays on the exterior, then the null space did not go interior, and this is going to be a reconstruction you could recover. If you wanted to add in noise, then what you would do is you would imagine that this red dot was your measurement B in R little n, and you'd put a ball around this point, right? That would be your noise, and then you would project that onto the sphere, and you would wonder what happens as to how far you go from the K face and these kind of things. So the extension to adding noise is also uh, straightforward. Now, once you see this connection for this L1 problem, you can see that actually what we care about is wondering when these faces survive projection. Okay, so this has led uh, David Donahoe and myself to become sort of amateur uh, <coughs> stochastic geometers where we started looking at various geometric objects and asking this question about counting their faces. Project this object and wonder what happens. So we did that uh, for the L1 ball and here's the kind of phenomena that you see. So there's a region here which corresponds to simple vectors for which Actually, when you do this projection, uh, all of the K faces remain exterior. This means that if you ran something like lasso and you had no noise, you would be able to recover the K sparse vector all of the time, no matter where the non-zeros were. Very strong guarantee. And then there's another region up here, this curve, for which once you go above this, you should expect that there are going to be certain uh, configurations of the predictors for which you would not get success, but for the vast majority, all but a vanishingly small fraction of the time, you would in fact get success. You would find the, the case sparse vector you were looking for, not all the time, but most of the time, and then once you go beyond this, it turns out that what you'll find is that typically you won't. Typically the algorithm is going to fail. If you try lasso in this kind of regime, you really have no reason to suspect that it's going to work. In fact, you have every reason to believe that the algorithm is going to just give you garbage. So now we can see sort of clear delineation amongst these, and hopefully this curve, if your memory is sharp, uh, sort of looks reminiscent of these first three plots. These, this is, in fact, the curve that I showed overlaying those first three experiments, and for the second two, we have reason as why this is, in fact, uh, governing the behavior. For the first case of the forward stepwise uh, progression, this is sort of a mystery as to why, but it connects back with these notions of greedy algorithms and why greedy algorithms sometimes behave like these global optimizers. Uh, so it's not completely unexpected, but you know, we don't have a good theoretical backing of that. Now, as I said, we've become these uh, amateur stochastic geometers, so of course once the L1 ball was examined, we had to start looking at other things as well. So uh, the next natural thing to do would be to say, well, let's build in some further information about the signal that we're interested in. Let's say that this signal is not just simple, but in fact, if a coefficient, one of our predictors, is, uh, is not zero, if one of our predictors is active, then we actually know uh, the sign of that predictor. Okay? So there are applications where that's certainly the case. We don't know whether it's non-zero or not, but if it is non-zero, we know whether it's positive or negative. Okay? What, what can we get out of building in that kind of incorporation? So now instead of doing min L1 subject to x equals gb, we do min L1 subject to knowing the sign pattern, such as, say, non-negativity, ax equals b. This corresponds to analyzing the projection of a simplex in high-dimensional geometry, and we see the same kind of phenomena going on, and you can see this experimentally as well. We see that this region of success became a higher. So that building in this prior information actually makes things better. And here the region where it was usually successful became higher. See greater success again. Now, uh, we'll come back to this in, uh, in a few moments. We'll see that uh, actually this phenomena for L1 minimization, which is what's going on here, we're doing something like lasso with non-negativity constraint, is, is not, well, you can sort of get around having to use L1 minimization, which is quite a new result and I think is quite perplexing in many ways. But before getting to that, I wanted to make a comment about these two curves. These results were, uh, were all proven, uh, these are analytic proven results. They were all proven though for Gaussian matrices. Now, we're not just theoreticians, we, we wanted to do experiments. And uh, for the kind of problems that we're interested in, we usually can't use Gaussian matrices because doing a matrix vector product is too <coughs> expensive. So we need to use matrices which are, say, Fourier, so that we can do fast Fourier transform or we need matrices which are very sparse. Most of the entries are zero, something like that. So we did a bunch of experiments over the last few years, and we observed that if you do these experiments and you see when it goes from success to failure, you find the 50% success uh, line, and you plot that 
in this feeling for all of these different ensembles, both where you don't know what the sign pattern is or you do have this uh, non-negativity constraint, this sign constraint, we see a very good visual agreement uh, with these curves that we had uh, analyzed. So it seems like actually this is telling us what's going on, not just for Gaussian matrices, but for a very broad class of matrices. Even matrices, uh, one of these is, uh, is the expander P matrix, where P is equal to 1 over 15, which means that only 1 out of 15 entries are non-zero, and all the ent other entries are, and those entries that are non-zero are 1. So it's a very, very sparse matrix. But very quickly, you see exactly the same phenomenon. Uh, so we subjected this to some, some rigorous statistics. We see the z-scores. We see that they're consistent with, uh, with the expectation, uh, with, the, with the, what we see with the, uh, the Gaussian. This is going to be coming out in a recent uh, special issue of Filtrans A that was edited by uh, Professor Titterington. These are in the case of non-negativity as well. You can see that uh, there is uh, some discrepancy. This discrepancy goes away as the problem size increases, and it scales sort of the way you would expect, like n to the minus uh, one-half. Okay, now let's talk uh, in the last couple moments about two other kind of geometric objects we could talk about. So let's talk about the orthant. So not just the simplex. So we're not going to be doing this uh, min L1, but we're just going to be looking at vectors which satisfy some sign constraint. And we're going to be having a, a bit of a divorce from the usual compressed sensing paradigm where we're not going to be building in an algorithm. So we're going to ask a different question. We have a vector x. We know its sign pattern. Let's say it's not negative. It's k sparse. We measure it. All right. Now, I don't say anything about an algorithm. I just want to know, is there any other vector which satisfies that sign constraint, which is not equal to the original vector I had, but has the same measurements? Okay. If there isn't, then any algorithm must be successful. If there are other, other vectors, then maybe you need some kind of special algorithm like Lasso to try to uncover them. Well, what we see is there's a region here for which uh, it tends to be unique. And here, there's a region where it's always going to be unique. And in that region, which is not so it's such a large region, we know that uh, any algorithm would be successful. There's something really unusual going on here. Once you see the geometry and you think about what a positive orthant is, here you have a positive orthant, imagine you cut it at a case where the, the vector has mean 0. That would give you a regular simplex. And then that would correspond to the geometric object we were projecting for this non-negativity constraint. So you can ask the same question about uniqueness, but here you make one subtle change. You make sure that you measure not just with, say, uh, a Gaussian matrix, but you append to it a row of ones. Okay? Very subtle change. You measure the sum of the non-zero, uh, the sum of the entries in your predictor, uh, in your signal of interest, and all of a sudden, geometrically, the phase transition changes to the simplex phase transition. And that tells you that this entire region that we had that told us what was going on when you did min L1, i.e. lasso with non-negativity constraint, actually any algorithm must work in that region okay? because the answer is unique. So you don't have to use something like lasso there. If you're just slightly clever, you don't use Gaussian, but Gaussian's with a row of ones, then your null space must uh, go along uh, a simplex and a very dramatic difference occurs. And if you try this experimentally, you will, in fact, see this is the case. Uh, so there's one last object that one just sort of has to look at if you're doing this game. There's three regular polytopes. There's the L1 ball, which is called the cross polytope, the simplex, and the uh, hypercube. So one must, of course, look at the hypercube, project the hypercube to sort of complete the story. And you see the exact same kind of phenomena going on. The only difference is that there isn't a uh, a region where it's successful all the time. There doesn't exist such a region, uh, but there is a region where you get successful, uh, unique solution most of the time. Uh, but uh, what it means to be uh, simple is not the same as sparsity. It's this different notion about not being a sum boundary constraint. We don't have time to go into the details. So here's a quick summary. We've, uh, we've looked at uh, these three regular polytopes, and we've looked at a cone. And we have theoretical results which tell you when the, uh, the kind of uh, questions we're asking give you success. For uh, the simplex and the L1 ball, we know the results for Gaussian, but it seems to be true for anything. And we can, in fact, design particularly good matrices uh, in the case of the simplex, but we don't know how to do this in L1. This is an open question. For the hypercube, it turns out that actually the result is true for any matrix in general position. So there's nothing random going on here. This is quite an unusual thing. 
there's just a fixed number of times where it's going to be unique and a fixed number of times where it's not going to be unique. And there's a simple formula for it, and we can give it to you. And because there is this general, uh, uh, that it's always the same answer, you can't design anything clever. Uh, and for the orthant, uh, you can design something clever by doing this row of ones, and it has a big impact. The other curves that I showed are for anything with uh, exchangeable centrally symmetric columns. I can tell you why that's the case if you'd like uh, later. And there are a list of papers where these results are presented. Thank you. <laughs>